All right, well, let's pray. God in heaven, thank you so much for uh, this Sabbath day that uh, is it'll be ending soon, but we thank you for this um, time that you give us just really to focus on you, to fellowship with you, and we want to ask tonight that you would guide in these presentations, that you would direct uh, Pastor Tim's thoughts and his words, and that you would speak to us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to see Jesus and to be even more ready uh, for his glorious return. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at the topic, Jesus rescues his people. How many of you are alive because of a successful rescue? I am. I know the ranger's name that risked his life to save mine. I probably won't forget that right away. <laughs> it's been quite a few years ago, actually 20 years ago, that I was rescued by a ranger. And uh, I still remember it. But I'm really looking forward to this rescue. Really, that one's going to be spectacular. By the way, you don't really value a rescue unless you know that you need it. And I knew that if I and my team didn't get rescued, we wouldn't make it. And I know on this one, if Jesus doesn't come and rescue us, we wouldn't make it. So these are good rescues, all right? Uh, I feel like offering you condolences because some of you are wondering how I'm doing. This is my fourth hour of presentation. <laughs> I'm wondering how you're doing. <laughs> I would far rather be standing for four hours than sitting for four hours, personally. So, but the Lord is good. My voice is still here. Um, I can tell you, there have been a couple of times that I've lost it, as far as the voice. And I do drink a lot of water trying to hang on to a voice. But I remember in Roseburg, Oregon, I started running a fever, little fever, just as I got there. Not a ma major one. I thought, uh-oh, and I felt a drip in my throat. And right away, boom, I started struggling. And everybody but everybody was offering me a cure. This was pre-COVID. Some of those were nasty. But I was desperate trying. And I remember standing up front of everybody. I preached the 545 one. And as soon as I'm done, my wife says, be quiet, don't say a word to anybody. I was quiet. I had 45 minute break. I came back up front and I tried to talk. Nothing came out, nothing. <sighs> my wife is in the back and she has a DVD ready in their computer, ready to go with her pre-recorded, okay? <laughs> And I thought, oh, come on, Lord. And I asked for help. And I tried to make a sound, nothing. I tried to make a sound in a different tone. I tried a couple of different tones and I found a tone that I could make a noise in. And I started preaching. And as I preached, it just got stronger and stronger. I finished and I couldn't make a noise. <sighs> God is good. <laughs> um, but so we're gonna look at Jesus rescuing his people. And let's go the right direction. What was that? Anyway, yeah, we do have those ready for us tonight. We've been working our way through Daniel 12, 1 through 3. Michael stood up. That's the end of the judgment. There's a time of trouble like there never was. And then as the king of the north goes down, Jesus delivers his people. That's where we are. I want you to notice something. Up through Daniel 11, 43, Daniel 11, verse 43, it's almost all geopolitical stuff. He's showing you what's going to happen in the order of events and all this kind of stuff. And it's interesting. Lots of people want to sit back and watch this. What does the Bible say is coming? Yeah, this is interesting. But in verse 44, through 12.3, it takes a turn and it starts hitting one 
Bible truth after another that the papacy is twisted. One tells you what the papacy is doing through history, and now it tells you how it impacts you. It's as if God is using these events to bring us right to the time of the end and saying, okay, folks, I know what's coming. Now here's how you need to be living at this time. It's kind of neat how all this works. It just takes this turn in the text. And these are all areas, as I pointed out, they changed who Michael was. They changed from a natural historical outflowing to all, everything's in the future. One thing after another that they've changed. Well, there's some stuff here too that's important to understand. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So, this is what we're looking at. The deliverance. In Daniel 2, the deliverance happens right here at the foot when the rock, Jesus, sets up his kingdom. Dwight Moody says there's over 2,500 references to the coming of Christ in the Bible. I'm going to believe him. I'm not going to count them. I know there are lots of them. One of my favorite ones is John 14, 1 through 3. We had it for a text this morning in the church service. Let not your hearts be troubled. In a crazy world, don't get too worried about it because God is in control. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus is preparing a place at the Father's house, that's in heaven, and he's going to come get us and take us there, right? That's good news. Now, some things we know about the second coming of Christ. Some people call it the rapture, but those of you getting concordances, you can look up the word rapture. It's not in there. It's not in the Bible. Second coming of Christ, the coming, those words are there. The coming of Christ, his return. A couple of things about this, five facts. Number one, it will be literal. Acts 1, 9 through 11. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them, those would be angels, in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. They came out of Jerusalem walking with him, and he went up into heaven. He was very real. When he comes back, he's going to come in the clouds again and he's going to be very real. As a matter of fact, remember Thomas wasn't so sure about this. And he says, I'm not going to believe it until I see the holes in his hand and the holes in his side. I've got to touch them before I believe Jesus has been resurrected. And Jesus shows up in the room, locked doors and all, and Jesus shows up. Whoops. <laughs> Hi, Thomas. Oh, Lord, I believe... Oh, no, no, no. Come check. I heard you. <laughs> and he comes over and he checks the holes in his hand and the holes in his side. Jesus says, give me some honeycomb and some fish. What's this about? Jesus is proving he's very real. You can touch him. And he can take food and he can eat it and he can swallow it and it's gone. He is very real. The same Jesus that comes back will be very real. Only, you know, the Bible says when we're resurrected, we're going to have resurrection bodies like he did. Remember the doors were locked when he came into the room? Last time I tried to go through a wall, it hurt. <laughs> but Jesus can literally go through a wall. By the way, the physics isn't that hard, if you could do it. You know that matter really is more space than solid. 
if you could stop the, the electrons from going around those atoms, I mean, there's far more space in something than there is solid. And so if you could stop the electrons in the walls and stop the electrons in your body for a moment, you could pass right through without a problem. It's just I can't do that right now. But evidently Jesus can do stuff like that. Hey, wouldn't that be fun to have a resurrection body like his? It's real, but you can also do really fancy things like go through walls. You can go up in a cloud and go through space without a spaceship. It sounds like fun to me. <laughs> It will be visible, Revelation 1-7. Behold, he's coming with clouds, and how many eyes are going to see him? Every eye. Even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. Definitely has to be a resurrection that it's mentioning here, too, for that to happen. Now, if you killed Jesus, one of those who crucified him, Remember, he told them and the Jewish leaders that they would see him coming in his power, which means they would be resurrected to see him coming. Do you think most of them want to see him coming in power? Did you notice I said most of them? Because remember what the centurion said, surely this was the Son of God. They heard Jesus say things like, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I believe some of those soldiers and probably some of those leaders eventually accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And for them, seeing him coming will be a spectacular thing to be able to see him come. That could be good for them. But most of the people, all the tribes of the earth will what? Mourn because of him. They will not be happy when they see him coming. So somebody tells me one time, hey, Tim, this is a round earth. Not everybody could see Jesus coming at the same time. Really? The God who created this thing by speaking couldn't figure out how to do this? Can human beings watch the same sporting event at the same time around the world? Satellites, right? Do you think if human beings can figure out how to use technology to watch the same thing, that maybe God has better technology? As a matter of fact, I know how you can do it with physics. Again, I just can't pull it off, but I know the, t the, the idea. If you have the earth, if you were to literally have something traveling around the earth really fast, like somewhere around the speed of light, and you had a strobe, it could be actually even slower than the speed of light and you had a strobe hitting in the right frequency, it would look like everybody, to everybody, like Jesus is coming straight in at them. And by the way, he says, when he comes, there's lightning. There's your strobe. I don't know. If I can figure out a way that he can pull it off, you think the creator of all this thing might have many ways to pull it off? <laughs> it says it, I'm pretty easy okay with that, that he can do it. Matthew 24, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive if possible even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say, look, he's in the desert, do not go out, or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Somebody says, hey, Jesus is in Dallas, don't go. Why? Because when Jesus returns, he's going to return in the clouds and every eye will see him. And if you've got to go somewhere to see him, it isn't Jesus. All right? It's just really simple that way. And I don't intend to go. Why? Because Satan can be very deceptive. And if Jesus tells me not to go, then he knows what he's talking about. I'm not going to go. However, if I get drugged there against my will, I'm going to have protection from Jesus that I wouldn't have if I went there rebelliously. Like, I will go into some of the roughest neighborhoods on this planet in the night to reach somebody for Jesus. I've done it a few times. But I won't go there on my own just for the entertainment of it. Because when I'm going for Jesus, I expect it's his problem, not mine. When I'm going on my own, I think it's probably my problem, not his. 
So I won't go to some of these places unless I'm on his mission. I was walking through a high crime housing project one night. <laughs> I was cutting between one building and another building because I had two people I wanted to visit for Jesus that night. And I'm walking through some bushes <laughs> and I find a police officer hiding in the bushes. And as I walked by him, I said, man, you're not that well hidden. <laughs> Uh, it can be fun once in a while. <laughs> it will be audible. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet, trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Hey, I don't think Jesus is trying to hide when he comes back at the time of the resurrection. If you're trying to hide, do you have a shout and a trumpet? No. Every eye sees him. It's everybody can hear him. He's coming in, making all kinds of noise. Ever heard it said, you're making so much noise you could raise the dead? I mean, when I was a kid, I was told that with my friends and I sometimes. Jesus comes in making enough noise, he does raise the dead. He's got the abilities. It would be glorious. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father and with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Aren't you glad that he'll forgive your, your sins and apply his record over yours so that it works out okay when he re rewards you according to works? That's good news. But he comes with all his glory, all the angels' glory, and all the Father's glory. Well, let's just take it for a moment and think back to Mount Sinai. Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and says he actually wants to see God in his glory. And God says, no, that's not a good idea. It would kill you. And Moses persists. God says, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put you in a rock. I'm going to cover you with my hand. I'm going to pass by and I'm going to remove my hand. I'm going to let you get a glimpse of my glory from behind. Evidently, to see God's glory from in front is more powerful than from behind. Keep that in mind because it plays really into our presentation tonight because there's going to be something about the face of Jesus in a little bit. But Moses gets a glimpse of God's glory from behind. A few days later, he comes down off the mountain and the children of Israel are begging him to put a veil over his face because it is glowing so brightly it's bothering them. He got a glimpse of God's glory and he's still glowing days later? Huh, that's pretty impressive. That was a glimpse. This is all come in the glory of his father, his angels, his glory. One measly angel showed up at the tomb of Jesus and gave a glimpse of glory and a hundred Roman soldiers fall over like they're dead men. And here comes millions of angels not hiding their glory at all. What do you think the wicked are going to feel like about this moment? 2 Thessalonians, uh, chapter 1 and 2. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from his presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he's coming in, He's coming in, he says, to trouble those who are troubling his kids. Daniel 11, king of the north goes out to destroy and annihilate his people, and Michael stands up and says, no, you don't. And he gives them trouble like they've never had, time of trouble like there's never been. He's slowing them down on their attack of his people as he's coming in to rescue his people. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. It will be very climactic, kind of really big bang boom event and get your attention. Matthew 24, 27. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. You guys live in Texas, you know what a thunderstorm's like. 
Some of you have uh, storm shelters right beside your house or in your house, a safe room, right? It's because of tornadoes that can come out of those thunderstorms. We don't have those where I live in Idaho. They don't know how to throw a thunderstorm where I live. <laughs> we have a few, but they're wimpy ones in comparison to yours. I've lived on the Arkansas-Oklahoma border. I know what thunderstorms are like. I know what tornadoes are like. I remember when I was in high school, a senior, I was in a Christian boarding school, northwestern Arkansas, for my senior year, just one year there. Oh, that's when I figured out that this, you know, along the Arkansas-Oklahoma border knows how to throw a thunderstorm pretty well. And that particular night, my roommate and I were laying in our beds. We were in a corner room in that dormitory. And my roommate and I are actually both Christians, and we love the power of nature because it's all about God's power, right? God created all this stuff. He's even bigger than nature is. And my roommate laying there says, Lord, how about a nice close hit? Lightning's popping out there. Just a few moments later, a tree not far outside of our window goes, <laughs> blew the bark off of it. My roommate's first response was, Lord, that's close enough. <laughs> If you had lightning strike near you, you know the feeling. That was close enough. That's a get your attention kind of event, but now take a close look. Revelation 6. This is even bigger. Then the sky recedes as a scroll when it's rolled up. I've watched video of the sky receding. You have too, you may not just remember it. If you look at the sky over a nuclear explosion, think about it. What you see is as the nuclear bomb goes off, there's a hole that develops in the sky. It just kind of peels back as the mushroom cloud is coming up. And as the cloud starts to fold out like this, all of a sudden, <clears throat> it comes back together again. That massive release of energy kind of blows a hole in the sky. Watch it sometime. What's happening here, as Jesus is coming down with all his glory, it's literally blowing a hole in the sky as he comes in. Pretty awesome stuff, isn't it? And every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. It said that they had gathered together the fight against God. He's not trying to hide. He's visible. He's making noise. They're going to see him coming. I can expect that NASA, you know, all of a sudden picks up, there's something coming. And you know what this world would do if there was something coming from space? All these nations that are fighting against each other and they have their nuclear weapons aimed at each other would suddenly point them out because they've already decided that's what they do if there was an asteroid coming in they'd all try and hit it and knock it off course or blow it up i can just picture the lead angel coming in and here comes a intercontinental ballistic missile at him hey they're throwing firecrackers at us grab it turn around throw it back or maybe just god's force field that's blowing the sky back just incinerates them as they're coming at them. Look at what all these people do, these generals, these mighty men, everybody that's lined up to fight against him. They launch what they have, in other words, and it doesn't work. Now what do you do? You dive in a hole. And you go down in caves during the worst earthquake in Earth's history. How scared do you have to be to want to be in a cave during an earthquake? But when the sky has Jesus in it and you've been fighting against him, you don't want to be above ground. And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from what? The face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Remember God told Moses, if you were to see my face, it would destroy you. And here comes Jesus in all his glory and everybody sees him face on. And those that have been fighting him can't 
take it, and they dive into the holes. Which side do you want to be on? Now I'm going to show you in a little bit what God does so his people don't have to hide, so they can take seeing him in all his glory. So you have the coming of Jesus. And even a little child that trusts in Jesus will be running towards him. Just like when he cleansed the temple, the kids stayed in the temple and the priests and the rulers ran out. It'll be the same kind of thing. And there's going to be resurrection. It mentions that in Daniel. It mentions that in Revelation. It mentions that in Thessalonians. We've seen all that. When Jesus is coming in and every eye sees him, there is a resurrection of all who have ever died trusting in him. Man, that is going to be spectacular. And I do... I am aware that that's a strange picture. It is there for a very specific reason. Here's why it's there. Most people don't understand how big this deliverance is because they don't understand what this resurrection means. You see, the papal system has given us another falsehood that's messed us up. And we don't understand how good the deliverance is because we've been told something that's not true. Isaiah says something very important in chapter 8. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. You know, I, driving around here, I saw somebody that's got a palm reader sign or whatever out. You have people that are spirit mediums and all kinds of stuff, and they communicate with the dead that tell you all kinds of stuff. The Bible says don't go listen to them. It says check this word out, the, to the law and the testimonies. Check this to find out what happens. And when you do, you find out something amazing if you take a careful look. In Revelation, it tells us that the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations. The papal system has deadened people's senses by giving them falsehoods. And I'm just here to tell you that typically when you go to a funeral, you hear things that aren't true. Let me illustrate it. Jesus said, wide is the way to destruction, narrow the way to life, right? Meaning, the majority of people end up lost, a minority end up saved. That's what it means. Pretty much everybody would agree with me on that. Except, how many times when you go to a funeral have you heard them say, well, this person probably didn't make it? Very few people have ever told me they've heard that. Where well, that pastor wouldn't do very many funerals. Huh. But Jesus said the majority of people end up lost and only a minority end up saved, which means most of the time at a funeral when they say they just made it into heaven, they're not telling you the truth. Hmm. Let's dig into what the Bible truth really is. By the way, who gave us permission to decide who goes to heaven and hell anyway? I'm not the judge. I can't say somebody's going to be in heaven or somebody's going to be in hell. I'm not the judge. Maybe that's why I don't do a lot of funerals. I'm not going to say where they are. I'm going to talk about Jesus, who will leave, leave no stone unturned to get somebody in, because he died to get them in, not keep them out. So he's going to do everything possible to get them in. But I'm not the judge. I can't tell you how they're going to spend eternity. It is kind of interesting when I do funerals. <laughs> um, so let's go to the Bible and see what Jesus can tell us from his word. 1 Thessalonians 4. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. The Bible term for death is often sleep. All right? Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Oh, it didn't say you'd never sorrow, just you wouldn't have hopeless sorrow. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Did you just notice that the Bible says we are to comfort each other at a funeral? Not that we will, when we die, we meet each other in heaven, but when we will meet again if we're trusting in Jesus at the resurrection. Hmm. It's a little different, but that's what the Bible says. All right? Let's keep going. Daniel 12, 2. We read a bit as we started tonight. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. There are two resurrections. First a good one, then a bad one. You do not want to sleep in for the second one. All right? And Revelation will be even more explicit about that. And by the way, we're going to unpack the second resurrection tomorrow night. Daniel 12, 13. Daniel's told there's two resurrections, good one and a bad one, but look what, it tells, what God himself tells him. But you, Daniel, go your way till the end, for you shall rest. He's going to die. And you will rise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Oh, did you just catch? It didn't say, Daniel, you're going to die and go to heaven. It said you're going to die, you're going to rest, and wake up at the resurrection at the end of time. That's what it actually says. Hmm. John 11. Story of Lazarus. I love this story. The, uh, so, here's what's happening. Jesus is out on a preaching trip and his friend Lazarus gets sick. And his sisters, Mary and Martha, send a message to Jesus. The one you love is sick. And they're expecting Jesus is going to come flying back over... No, oh, running. Can't fly then. And uh, he gets back home and he is going to heal him. But Jesus just keeps preaching out there. He didn't come back. A little while later, he tells his disciples, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples says, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. And Jesus spoke, however, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. He says, let's go back and wake him up. Okay, when he's well, I mean, sick and alive, you won't go. Now that he's dead, you're going to go wake him up. Okay. It must have been a little strange being a disciple. Jesus didn't do things the way everybody expected. And you know, the disciples must have almost gotten tired of looking kind of goofy over and over again when they messed up. But Jesus loved them, so they stuck with Jesus. And Jesus heads back. And what happens? First, Martha meets him. And she says, Lord, if you would have just come back, my brother would still be alive. So it's Jesus' fault that he's dead. And Jesus said, you'll see your brother again. And notice her answer. She says, yes, I know, at the resurrection. And Jesus said, this is actually to the glory of God. Take me to the tomb. So Mary joins with them, and they go over to the tomb, and everybody's crying. And it says Jesus wept as well. Think of it. They're standing in the presence of the life giver and they don't get it. Jesus was weeping in sympathy with their sorrow, but probably also, when are you going to wake up and realize what's really going on here? And Jesus says, okay, roll the stone away. And the sisters go, no, no, no. He's been dead four days. It's going to stink when you roll that stone away. This was exactly Jesus' point on why he waited to come. He was waiting till Lazarus, his friend, was stinking dead. Because he wanted to make it clear what kind of power he has. And he figured his friend Lazarus would be okay with it when it was done. And so, somebody rolls the stone away. Probably Peter. He's impetuous enough to have done it. Somebody rolls the stone away and it stunk. And all Jesus' enemies standing there, the priest and the rulers, they're going, oh, Jesus is going to mess up this time. And his disciples are going, man, we gave up our businesses for this. Man, I hope he can pull off whatever he's got in mind. Everybody's got a lot at stake. What is Jesus going to do? And Jesus calls Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. Now, however he did it, he had to be very specific. 
because Jesus is the life giver. And if Jesus gave a generic wake up from the dead statement, he'd have every dead person who ever died. So Jesus has to be careful about this one. And he calls this particular Lazarus out. Now, the way they bury people is there's a cave and there's a rock shelf in there like, and they wrap you up with some spices, perfumes, whatever, and you rot. And after a year or two, they come in and they take your bones and they put them in a little stone box and then they'll use the shelf again for somebody else. And then they'll put those bones in a little box and they just store the boxes in there and they can reuse the shelf. Lazarus is wrapped all up, laying on the shelf. And he wakes up. He hears Jesus calling him. Can you just picture waking up wrapped up like a mummy? But Jesus is calling. Lazarus, come out. Lazarus tries to get his feet down. <clears throat> Can you picture outside the cave? All of a sudden, something starts moving in there. Do you know what a lot of those people are doing? <gasps> They're backing up. Why are we afraid of dead people? Because we're believing Satan's lies. Actually, I've never had a dead person cause me trouble. Living ones, on the other hand, some of them have. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And they start hearing something. And Jesus said, would somebody go in and set him free? Let him loose. Unwind him. And Lazarus comes out and he's completely healthy. Oh, wow. That got everybody's attention. And you know what the leader started doing? Planning how they killed Jesus because you can't have somebody running around that can raise people from the dead. I mean, if you let this happen, everybody could follow him and not us. Oh, yeah, that was a lot of jealousy going on right there. Power-hungry leaders. Can't let this go on. Same thing happens. You start studying Bible truth and people tell you, oh, no, don't do that. It's all about power over and over. These things he said, and after that he said, our friend, oh, I went the wrong way. Here we go. Well, how much does a dead person know while they're dead? The Bible says nothing. I mean, the Bible says they know nothing. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore they will, have a, will they have a share in anything done under the sun. The Bible said the dead cannot communicate with us. Don't go try to listen to them because that's Satan that's pretending to be a dead person. I mean, he can pretend to be an uh, angel of light, an angel from heaven. He can pretend work through a snake. He can do lots of things. But it said the dead cannot communicate with the living in any way. So if something is communicating with you claiming to be a dead person, it isn't them if you believe the Bible. Ezekiel 18.4, somebody says, well, what about the immortal soul? I mean, if there's an immortal soul, they can communicate. But do you realize the Bible nowhere says we have an immortal soul? I know we've been told that, but it's not in the Bible. Exactly the opposite is in the Bible. Immortal soul means a soul that cannot die, but look what the Bible says in Ezekiel 18 verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sinned shall die. How many people have sinned? Romans 3 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Other than Jesus, all have sinned. So we're all going to die. We don't have immortal souls. Hmm. Here's another one, New Testament. The King of kings and Lord of lords who alone has immortality. If only God has immortality, do I have it? No. If I have it, that would be a lie. The Bible doesn't lie. That's got to be true. I don't have it. Well, if I had it, I wouldn't need God to give it to me in the future either, would I? But the Bible says there's a point coming when he will give us immortality. 
Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. <laughs> this is about when Jesus resurrects the dead. Now it says in a twinkling of an eye, which means it's not going to take long, right? And Jesus won't have to go through some long process. It's like in the blink of an eye. Except I love that twinkling of an eye phrase. Because if you were Jesus and you were now able to resurrect everybody that's ever followed you and loved you, don't you think his eyes are dancing for joy when he gets to do this? Oh, it's going to be fun for him. I'm looking forward to it and I'm not the one with the power. I'm just going to watch it happen. So in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this what? Mortal must put on immortality. We get it at the resurrection. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Did you catch it? The victory happens not when I die, but at the resurrection when Jesus comes. In other words, I don't have the power, only Jesus has the power, but we've been told we are immortal. No, no, friends. We don't have immortality until God gives it to us. And as Jesus is coming down in a blink of an eye, in the twinkling of an eye, he gives immortality to his people. And when they have that gift, they can stand in the presence of God's glory face to face and not be destroyed. As he's coming in, he gives the ability to withstand his glory to his people. But those that are lost don't get it. And they go diving into the holes during the worst earthquake in earth's history. You want that gift, but it's not yours until he gives it to you. Somebody says, well, what about the Bible saying the spirit returns to God? It does say that in Ecclesiastes. So let's go to Genesis 2 and unpack what that spirit is. Spirit returns to the God who gave it. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The word in Hebrew for breath is the spirit. And man became a living being. The word is soul. So God takes Adam, makes, forms him out of the dirt, blows into his nostrils the breath of life. And Adam wakes up. He's a living person. A full-grown living person on their first day of life. That would be an interesting one. And God starts teaching him things right away. So let's take a look at something. We can do this like a math equation. God takes the dirt, makes a body, and he blows into it. So the body, the dirt, plus the breath or gift of life, for the spirit, equals a living soul. However, you can do the reverse. You take the soul, you take away the breath or the spirit, and you just have a pile of dirt again. The spirit is the gift of life. God blew into him this gift, the breath. The word for spirit is breath, and both in the Old and New Testament. In John chapter 3, uh, Jesus talking about the spirit. He says the spirit is like the wind. In the Greek, it goes like this. The panuma is like the panuma. And Nicodemus is going, what? Because the word for breath or wind is the same as the word for spirit. The spirit is that breath, the gift of life. Now, let me illustrate it this way. If this is the body, the bulb, how much light does a light bulb give if it's not connected to the power source? None. But if we connect it to a power source, now it has light. Bulb, the body, plus the gift of life equals light. I mean, the breath equals life. Now, can you grab a handful of light and take it here and put it over here in the dark? No. But you can sure tell when light's there and when it's not there, right? You can sure tell when a person is living and when there's dead. I mean, I've been around lots of people as they die and there sure is a big difference. 
And it doesn't take long for the difference to show when they stop breathing. When that gift of life, that breath leaves them, all you have is a cold, dead body. When the power is disconnected, the bulb is still there, the body. But the life is gone. The soul that sins shall die. It ceases to exist except in the memory of God. But God can recreate it in an instant at the resurrection. And he puts the body and the spirit, he gives the breath of life back together, and man becomes a living being again at the resurrection. This time, at the first resurrection, never to die again. That, he gives immortality at that point. That's really good, isn't it? But how did we get the idea that when we die, we don't really die? It's in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, Satan lied. He told Eve, oh, you won't really die if you eat the fruit. You'll become like God. Oh, remember only God is immortal? So when we're told that we have an immortal soul, it's just continuing this story that Satan gave us. How well did it work out for Eve? Not so good, did it? Believing Satan doesn't work out so well. Did she die? Yeah, definitely not around anymore. Let's take a look at something. Let's take a hypothetical situation, play it both ways. One like we usually hear it at a funeral and then the other way like it seems to be a saying in the Bible. So we have a young lady that she wants to go shopping. It's a little before Christmas time. And she wants to go over towards Dallas somewhere to a big mall to go Christmas shopping for the kids. And her husband says, hey, look, I'll stay here in Mount Pleasant with the kids. You go Christmas shopping. I hate shopping. I'd far rather spend a day with the kids than going shopping. And she goes, fine, because she'd like to have a break from the kids for a little bit. She loves them dearly, but it'd be nice to have a break. They go buy gifts for them for Christmas. So she hops in the car and she takes off down there. On her way home, there's an accident on the interstate and she goes right underneath the big semi. And she's killed instantly. And the pastor comes to the door, maybe with a police officer. I've done those calls. And they talk to the young husband and they say, we're so sorry. There's been an accident. And... Uh, the pastor says, you know, God must have wanted her more than we did, and he took her home. Have you ever heard things like that? And the young husband says, if God wanted her more than I did, and he took her from me, I hate God. I've had to deal with people going through that. And then at the graveside, they say to these kids that are crying, the husband's angry, the kids are crying because they can't figure out why mama's not coming home. And the pastor says something like this, kids, you know, you've got a new angel in heaven watching over you. Heard those kind of things? So have I. If she's really up in heaven watching, what's it like? She's watching her husband that's angry at God. She's watching her kids that aren't being able to be comforted. And if she's able to keep watching, but re well, remember the Bible says there's no communication between the dead and the living. But anyway, but if it was possible, as we're told at funerals, and if that husband starts in his anger, in his grief, starts to abuse drugs, and then he starts abusing the kids, if she's up in heaven, heaven just became a lot like what? It'd be a lot like hell to watch that, wouldn't it? We don't think through what we're saying at funerals. And it doesn't match the Bible. But you and I all know that's the kind of stuff that gets said at funerals. Let's go back and replay it. This lady has the accident. The last thing she sees is the truck coming at her. 
and it goes black. The dead know nothing. If I'm telling the guy, I'm going to say, I'm so sorry. Your wife was just killed. We live in a world of sin, and Satan is a killer and a murderer. Because I don't mind if he hates somebody, but I want him to hate the one that's causing the pain and suffering. I'm going to say, and Jesus has promised to come again and save us from this. And at the graveside, I'm not going to say she's up in heaven watching. I'm going to say she's waiting for the resurrection if she was trusting in Jesus Christ. Somebody says, does that really work? Yeah, it does. I know. I, like many of you, have buried loved ones. June 13, tomorrow's the anniversary. Twelfth floor, MD Anderson Cancer Clinic. My 21-year-old daughter died in my arms. You can't stay there for the rest of your life. You've got to walk, turn your back and walk out that door. My wife and I went down those 12 flights of stairs. We skipped the elevators. We, need, we knew we needed to burn off some of this stuff. Downstairs, there's shuttle buses waiting to take us to our hotel. We said, forget it. We're walking. It's just three quarters of a mile to our hotel. We're walking down. It was early morning. We're walking through that concrete canyon in Houston, the hospital district. One tall hospital after another, side by side. Some of you have been there. There's a lot of suffering that goes on in that area. As we were walking along, I looked up at the sky and I saw the moon. Daytime, moon's out. And I told my wife, you know, the Bible says that when Jesus comes, he's going to resurrect us and take us back to heaven. I said, the last thing Jennifer knew, she was in our arms. The next thing she knows, if she's faithful and we're faithful, she'll be meeting Jesus at the resurrection. And we'll get to meet together with her. And we're going to be sailing right past that moon on the way to heaven with Jesus. And I can just tell you that the greatest party in this world will be the party on that cloud as we're reunited with Jesus, with disciples, and with loved ones. And I can just tell you that if I focus on what it was like in that room, I will go down. But I choose to focus on what it will be like at the resurrection. And it goes up. I know really clearly how it could make me crash. I choose to trust in Jesus, in his word, in the Bible. And it does bring comfort. As a matter of fact, when Jesus returns, I want to be near a cemetery. I don't care which one. I just want to be near a cemetery that has people that trust in Jesus Christ in it. Because it says, first, the dead are going to be raised and taken up into the clouds, and then the living go with them. I would like to be there and watch them come out of the ground. I want to see what it looks like. <laughs> I've watched a movie where and movies are usually wrong, but it sure was kind of funny. They just launched out of it like a missile coming up out of the water. <laughs> I don't know. But I do realize that even if I'm in a cemetery, I'm probably going to miss it. Because I'm going to be looking at Jesus, probably. But you know, I've put a lot of people in cemeteries. I've had funerals just five minutes apart with a break in between funerals before. You get tired of those. I want to see Jesus come again. I put a lot of people in the graves, and so far I've only seen one come out. Hmm, that was an accident. It was hilarious. I'm standing on a hillside cemetery in West Virginia. There is very little flat ground in West Virginia. <laughs> and it's a fairly steep hillside. And the funeral director walks around the uphill side of the casket while I'm preaching. And he slips right under the coffin, right down the hole. 
he grabs that railing around the edge of a coffin. He pulls and he pops back up beside me like, nobody saw that happen, did they? <laughs> and he's muttering under his breath, I've never had that happen before. <laughs> and I'm supposed to continue preaching. <laughs> But next time I see somebody come out, I'm expecting it's when Jesus comes, and that won't be an accident. That will be definitely on purpose. And it's going to be spectacular. I'm looking forward to it. It doesn't matter if you're in the grave five seconds or 5,000 years. If the dead know nothing, it will be as if there was no time passing. The last thing they knew was they were dying, the next thing is the coming of Jesus Christ in a reunion. Oh man, can't get better than that. Notice, all the saved get the same reward at the same moment. Nobody has to see the suffering of anybody else, of their family, because when they're resurrected, all the suffering is now past. God's got the perfect plan. What about communicating with the dead? The Bible calls them familiar spirits. You don't want to do it. Oh yes, Saul went to the witch of Endor. But I want you to notice, if you look carefully at it, Saul never saw Samuel. Only the witch did. If she really did. Maybe she did. Maybe she saw Satan. But it wasn't Samuel. The dead know nothing. Oh, could, could Satan impersonate Samuel? Yes. Could Satan know what's going to happen to Saul? Yes, because God had already said what was going to happen to Saul. Saul just didn't want to believe it. By the way, if a dead person shows up and talks to you, and I've met a lot of people that have had it happen, it's Satan impersonating. Oh, but they knew things that only my loved one knew. Well, if they knew things that were secrets that only you and they knew, then it was probably something you did wrong or everybody else would have known about it. And it was probably Satan who tempted you to do that wrong. So yes, he knows all that stuff. If Satan shows up with a, as a loved one to me, I'm going to do what Jesus did when he dealt with Satan. Get behind me, Satan. I am not going to talk to a loved one coming back when the Bible says the dead know nothing and I'm not supposed to communicate with them. Be careful. Satan is out to destroy you. I will tell you a real story that I was involved in. There was a guy by the name of Mike. He, was, uh, he just got out on bail, very serious charges. Eventually, he's going to get 20 years for what he did. But he was out on bail, and he'd never surrendered his life to God. He was a rough and tough country guy in the hills of Arkansas. And a mutual friend of ours told him, hey, I've got this pastor that I'd like you to talk to. Would you talk to him? He says, okay. So the friend calls me up and says, I want you to go talk to Mike. So I go out to Mike's house. It's way out in the country. I pull in the driveway. There are goats all over the place. I made a mistake. I left my brand new car right by the house. Thankfully, it was a grand, brand new Golf Volkswagen diesel. It wasn't a fancy car. You know what the goats are going to do. When I come out of the house, they're standing all on my car. <laughs> anyway, I go in the house and I talk to Mike and I want to share a gospel presentation because the most important piece of the Bible truth is we're sinners, but Jesus saves sinners, right? And I want to get him to trust in Jesus. That's the most important of all these Bible truths. So I'm sharing a gospel presentation and what is normally good news is Mike wants to read every one of these verses from his own Bible. As I say, that's normally good news, except Mike has the kin kindergarten reading level. And he's sounding out each word, and by the time he gets to the end of the sentence, he forgot what the first part of the sentence was about as he's working his way through. So his compre comprehension is about nothing. And he's working through this, and finally, I've, I've got to go. I'm out of time, and I just say, hey, Mike, you keep reading this. I'll come back in a few days after the weekend. He said, okay. 
I marked his Bible and all these verses. I said, you just, and I'm the Lord, help him understand this stuff. And I left. I came back. This time I parked a ways down the road. <laughs> Guess what? When I came out of the house, the goats had gone down the road. They were standing on my car. <laughs> but anyway, it was all worth it for Mike. And uh, I walk in the house. And I get a story. Over the weekend, Grandpa visited them. They're cooking breakfast. And as they're cooking breakfast, Grandpa walks in. Now, Grandpa's been dead for a couple of years. All right? But Grandpa walks in. He says, Mike, he said, you don't want to go through this trial. It's not going to end well. It's going to be bad for you and bad for the family. He said, I want you to go over there in the corner, pick up the rifle, commit suicide, and come with me. Dee Dee, Mike's wife, says, no, Grandpa, we need Mike more than you do. And Dee Dee and Grandpa get in a fight, and eventually, verbal fight. And eventually, Mike says, Grandpa, I am not going to do it. I promise before God and witnesses that I'm not going to leave her, and I'm not leaving her. And Grandpa gets mad and goes out. Best thing that could have happened to him right there. So they tell me that story and he says, okay, Mike, let's go back to what we were doing. And we go back to a gospel presentation. And right after the weekend, Mike accepts Jesus as his Lord and Savior. What was Satan trying to stop? You think that would be God sending grandpa? They have him commit suicide before he accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior? Not at all. Reminds me that you and I are all involved with principalities of darkness. Satan knows what we're planning to do to help other people and he will try to stop it. Well, Mike kept studying the Bible. And yeah, he got thrown in jail, 20 year sentence. And I continued visiting Mike in jail. And I remember shortly after he got thrown back in jail, and this is just a couple of months after I first met Mike, I'm in the jail visiting with him and we're studying the Bible together. and. Uh, I said, Mike, there's a verse, he'd ask a question, there's a verse and it um, talks about, and I give an idea what it is. He said, oh, that's over in, tr this is the guy that could barely read before. He's just focused in on the Bible and the Holy Spirit is leading him. And there's just one thing after another that I saw. So Mike really ends up doing prison ministry from the inside, sharing with other people in there. I don't know how life has turned out for Mike. That was many, many years ago. And I don't even remember his last name, so I can't even go try Facebook. But I will remember what happened with Mike. Satan can try and impersonate people. But if you're communicating with him, you're not communicating with him. <laughs> you're communicating with Satan. Somebody says, well, the Bible says absent from the body is present from the Lord. Yeah, it's in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 1 through 8. But people that say that have not actually read it carefully. Let's take a look at it. Most people think there are two stages, the earthly life and then you die and go to heaven, right? But what we're going to see when we read it carefully, there's an earthly life, there's naked where you're without life, the dead know nothing, they're sleeping, and then there's the future heavenly life. That's what the context actually shows. Let's read it. For we know that our earthly house, this tent is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. Well, you'd like to have go straight from the earthly clothing to the heavenly clothing, but there's this stage in between that's not so good when you're caught with nothing. For we are in this tent, for we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, I don't really want to die, but for the clothed, I would like to be in heaven though, right? that mortality may be swallowed up by life. In 1 Corinthians, he says, that happens at the resurrection. Not when we die. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. 
When you wake up in the morning, how long does it take you to figure out you're not in heaven? The older you get, the less time it takes. Because you've got to put glasses on to see what time it is. Or your back takes a while to straighten out. <laughs> so we're always confident knowing that while we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. If you ask me, I'd rather be in heaven than here. How about you? That's all he's saying. He'd rather be there than here. No kidding. It would be awesome to be there instead of here. I'm looking forward to being there. And then there's a thief on the cross. I see some people trying to read that. That's messed up on purpose, which you could guess. Why is it messed up on purpose? I'm trying to give you an idea of what it's like to read Greek. There's no capitalization, or very little capitalization in Greek, no punctuation, there's no spaces between words, and you just break it off when you hit the edge of the paper and start again. It doesn't matter where, and there's no hyphen that you broke it. So you have to know how to read, spell well in Greek to be able to read it. <laughs> the problem of it is, in a Greek verb, well, English verb, there's basic, basically only a couple of ways to spell it. Present, participle, and past tense. In Greek, there's about 314 ways to spell a verb, each with a different meaning. Yeah. And you've got to know all those spellings to figure it out. Let's make it easier. And I'm going to read this with no punctuation, which means I have to take a deep breath and go. All right? Because if I breathe, it punctuates it. And he said to Jesus, remember me, Lord, when you come in the kingdom of you and said to him, Jesus, truly I say to you today with me, you will be in paradise. Okay. Now, it needs some punctuation badly. Uh, what we have below here is the way it's punctuated in some Lutheran Bibles and basically it has this sense in the most Spanish Bibles. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. That doesn't mean it was that day he was in paradise. It would just, he, while he's hanging on the cross, he could look at this guy and say, you want to be in heaven with me? I can tell you right now, even in this condition while I'm dying, you're going to be with me in heaven. Not saying when. Now, as a matter of fact, Jesus died on Friday, but we're not sure the thief actually died before before Friday was over, because that's sunset. They broke his leg to hasten his death, but we're not sure he was actually dead by sunset. Now, here's another way. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Most English versions have that. Why? Because that's the way the Catholic Church punctuated it. Because they were already teaching the immortal soul before they put the punctuation into it. So they put the punctuation in to make it look like when Jesus and the thief died, they went straight to heaven. That's the only verse that could tell you that. But the punctuation didn't show up until about 10 centuries after it was written. Hmm. And if that's punctuated right, then Jesus is lying in John chapter 20, verse 17. When he tells Mary... Don't hang on to me. I have not yet ascended to the Father. That's on Sunday. If on Sunday morning he has not yet been to the Father, then he wasn't there on Friday. Whoops. So they must have got that punctuation wrong that they put in about eight to ten centuries later. What about the people that are already in heaven? Oh, there are people in heaven, but there's only three of them we know the names of. And you know what? None of them simply died and went to heaven. The Bible tells us how they got there. Enoch never died. He was taken straight to heaven. Elijah, he never died. He was taken straight to heaven. Moses, he died. God buried him. And Michael, the life giver, shows up. You read this in Jude. And it says... Jesus rebukes Satan, or Michael rebukes Satan. Satan says, you can't have him, he's mine. 
And Jesus said, tough, he's on credit. Well, that's basically what it was. Jesus rebuked him and raised him anyway. Had Jesus died for Moses' sins yet? Nope. The reason we know this is Moses was alive while Jesus was before Jesus' death. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah and Moses show up. And the disciples get all excited about this because they're there. We don't know exactly what Elijah and Moses came to talk to him about other than it says they talked to him about his impending death. Here's what could well have been going on. Jesus had 12 disciples that were kind of goofy. One of them was betraying him at this moment, or about to. The other 11, he's asking them to stay awake and pray with him, and they're sound asleep. Every time he does something, they mess it up. And Satan's going, you really want to leave the church in these goof-offs' hands? They're going to mess it up. They don't care. They don't get it. And Moses and Elijah show up and say, we get it. Jesus, take a close look at us. If you don't die for our sins, Satan gets us back because we're sinners in heaven on credit. And if Satan gets us back, it won't be pretty. Your death is going to work for millions of people. Just look at us. Moses says, I represent those that have trusted you and die and will be resurrected when you come again. And Elijah says, look at me. I represent those that will never die and be changed in a moment when you come again. And both of us will go back to Satan if you don't die for us. We get it. And Jesus could look at these two guys and know that his death was going to be effective for lots of people. What a privilege those two had. But there's nobody in heaven that we don't know how they got there. Nobody simply died and went to heaven. Jesus is coming again. And the truth is a lot better than the stories we've been told. And it's all about Jesus, friends. It's his power when he gives us the victory over sin at his return. We don't have the power ourselves. It's all about Jesus. And yeah, I'm looking forward to a resurrection. I really am. Our next presentation is Millennium and the New Earth. We talked about the first resurrection now. Second resurrection is coming on. Now, that's kind of a mixed bag. It's good and bad. But it ends up really good tomorrow night. And what's important about tomorrow night, it's going to show what the character of God is really like. And I hope you don't miss it because it's important to understand what God is really like. Oh, I forgot about this. That's why I have a slide in there. If any of you would ever like to help support our ministry, it's a faith ministry, which simply means um, there's no church organization that pays our bills. <laughs> and so... If you want to help with that, you can go to our website and make a donation. You can mail it in, make a donation, or you can hand it to me. The offerings here go straight to cover the cost of the seminar. And yes, they do support. I mean, they, they pay a fee to bring us in to help cover our expenses, but it only covers about half of them. The other half comes from other sources like donations and sales of materials. So if you want to do that, you can. But here's what I want to get to. Number one. The return of Jesus will be visible to everyone. It will be very loud and climactic. Do you see that as yes, no, or you're not sure? Number two, according to the Bible, death is a sleep in which the dead know nothing until the resurrection. It is at this resurrection that they meet Jesus and are taken to heaven. According to the Bible, death is a sleep and the dead know nothing. Yes, no, or question mark. Number three, since the dead know nothing, it's impossible to communicate with them before the resurrection. So Satan impersonates dead loved ones to deceive us. Um, so the dead know nothing. It can't be them talking to us. Number four, true followers of God will base all their beliefs on what the Bible says. I hope that's getting through to you. Follow the Bible. We're told all kinds of things. How do you know I'm telling you the truth if you're not reading it for yourself? No 
preacher or pastor should be upset with you if you dig in for yourself. If they are, it says they're not real. Well, they're, they're not really of God if they're upset about you digging into the Bible. Why? Paul commended the Bereans for asking for proof from the Bible. If you say, show me in the Bible, and they get mad at you, there's a problem. Five. That was just, if you'd like to know more about Adventist belief, and sometimes people put it down with a yes without their name, and that always frustrates a pastor. <laughs> they would like to give you what you asked for, but make sure you have a name on there. All right, let's close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for your love for us and for everything you've done. Thank you that you are big enough and strong enough that you are able to put an end of sin and that your plan works so well. Help us to trust you and your word. In Jesus' name, amen.